Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey everyone, Craig Baird here. Before I begin today's story, I want to take a moment and ask that you check me out on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Canada EHX. There are several tiers with great benefits, from ad-free content to t-shirts and other cool stuff. And if you're a fan of Canadian History X, make sure you check out my other shows, From John to Justin and Canada, A Yearly Journey. And don't forget, you can also donate directly to the show at www.canadaehx.com. It helps keep this show going. All right, on with the show. Farron's Point, Ontario, traces its history back to the 1790s when Charles Curtis Farron Sr. settled in the area. By the mid-1800s, the community boasted a population of over 300 people. And as the 19th century drew to a close, the village had two hotels, two inns, a bakery, several taverns, a marble shop, and a blacksmith shop. Needless to say, it was thriving. This is where, in 1891, a child named Cyril Joseph Denany was born, and he went on to win the Stanley Cup five times, and become the all-time leading scorer in the NHL upon his retirement in 1929. He is easily the most famous person to come from the community, but you won't find any monuments honoring him in Farron's Point. His childhood home hasn't been turned into a museum where you can see the spot where the hockey great first began to dream of hockey stardom. In fact, you can't visit this community at all. At least, the way it once was. If you want to see it, you need to put on some scuba equipment. That's because in 1958, one year after Cy Denony was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame, every resident of the community was displaced. Their homes were bulldozed, the businesses were razed to the ground, the trees were cut down. Ferenc Point was essentially wiped off the map. Once it was gone, the waters of the St. Lawrence River flowed through it. Before long, the community was submerged beneath its waves. But this is not the act of Mother Nature. Men did this. And now, only sidewalks and foundations exist of Farron's Point, under the river's waters. It was one of ten communities, the Lost Villages as they are called, to be permanently submerged in the name of progress. I'm Craig Baird, this is Canadian History X, and this is the story of the St. Lawrence Seaway. To begin our story, we need to journey back in time a few thousand years. The last ice age lasted from 115,000 to 11,700 years ago. The peak of that very cold time was 21,000 years ago. That's when almost all of Canada, except for much of modern-day British Columbia, was covered by ice sheets that were upwards of 3.2 kilometers thick over present-day Nunavut and thinner along the edges south of the Great Lakes. There was a lot of frozen water and a lot of weight pushing down on the earth below, Around 20,000 years ago, those immense ice sheets began to melt in a process that took nearly 10,000 years. And as the ice sheets melted, they retreated north, leaving behind a lot of water. And that's how many of our largest lakes, including Lake Winnipeg and the Great Lakes, were formed. Other bodies of water that were formed then are now mere remnants of what they once were, bodies of water like the Champlain Sea. The Champlain Sea formed from glacial meltwater about 13,000 years ago, and stretched from what we know today as Ottawa to Montreal and up to Quebec City. There was a time when whales swam where the Parliament buildings are now, because at its largest, the sea was 55,000 square kilometres in size. Within the waters of the Champlain Sea, a river was waiting to be born, the St. Lawrence. Much of our landscape has actually been shaped by the glaciers. South of Calgary, there's a town called Okotoks, The community takes its name from the massive glacial erratic that was transported 300 kilometers from the north 20,000 years ago and deposited on the open prairie. It's as tall as a three-story apartment building. I actually visited that location in 2001, and it's very interesting to see. And the name Okotok is actually the Blackfoot word for big rock. Now, the rivers have cut through the landscape from the Rockies to Hudson Bay, and they were shaped by the glaciers as they disappeared, and even places that were not touched by glaciers were shaped by them. In southeastern Alberta and southwestern Saskatchewan, there is the Cypress Hills. These hills were not covered by glaciers, 
and they have a landscape unlike anything in the surrounding area. Their flora and fauna is much more in line with the Rocky Mountains than the grasslands of the two provinces. The sea had been created by massive ice sheets that pressed down on the earth below it, and with them gone, the land rebounded and levels rose higher and higher year by year. It took 3,000 years, but eventually the Champlain Sea was gone, and what remained was the St. Lawrence River, which today is 500 kilometers long, 928 kilometers if we include its estuary. Water from the Great Lakes flow out and eventually find its way to the ocean via the St. Lawrence River, and it's not a quick process. A drop of water from Lake Superior on its western edge takes 200 years to reach the Atlantic. Possibly more than any other river in Canada, the St. Lawrence has played an important role in our history from the pre-colonial era onwards. For First Nations, the river was a vital trading route which covered hundreds of kilometers. Nations along the river had many different names for the St. Lawrence. The Algonquins called it Megatoic, meaning walking path. But most of the names for the river reflect exactly what it was, a great river. The modern name for the river comes from two men, Jacques Cartier and later Samuel de Champlain. Jacques Cartier arrived at the Gulf of the River on August 10, 1534, which was the feast day of St. Lawrence, the patron saint of librarians. He returned to England before venturing any further, but the Gulf had a name. When Jacques Cartier navigated up the river on his second voyage to North America in 1535, he believed he had found the Northwest Passage and a route to the Pacific Ocean. He was a bit off on that assessment. Regarding the Northwest Passage, a while back I covered the story of the Franklin Expedition, which attempted to find the passage. It ended in tragedy, but it makes for a compelling story, so I encourage you to check it out on my podcast, Canadian History X. When he reached River Rapids outside modern-day Montreal, he named the rapids La Chine, the French word for China. Those rapids put an end to any hope of sailing from the Atlantic Ocean to the interior of North America and the Great Lakes, at least for a while. Over the next few decades, French explorers called the river Grand Fleuve de Hochelaga and Grand Rivier de Canada. In 1604, Samuel de Champlain recorded the river's name as Fleuve Saint Laurent on a map, extending the name of the gulf to the name of the river itself, and thus the St. Lawrence River's name was born. A century and a half after Cartier first reached the Lachine Rapids, work to bypass them began. In 1680, a Montreal seminary began to dig a short 1.5 meter deep canal for canoes to use. It was a small step, but it was a start. Ten years later, the New France colonial government began the process of building a canal to allow ships to bypass the rapids, but due to costs and logistics, the canals did not go far beyond the planning stage. A man named Gideon de Casson attempted to build a canal in 1700, but he went bankrupt halfway through. And little was done for the next half century. Then New France was conquered by the British in 1765 following the end of the Seven Years' War. And the British finally decided to do something about those pesky rapids, but not right away. It took until the American Revolution, which took place from 1775 to 1783 for Britain to build canals to bypass the rapids. Britain was worried about an American attack along the border, and getting ships past Montreal was key to the defence along present-day southern Ontario. The British built four small canals connecting nearby Lake Saint-Louis and Lake Saint Francis at Montreal to aid the movement of narrow draft ships. And while these small canals did help, they were only 0.76 metres deep, with five locks that measured 1.83 metres wide. Yet, that was all that Montreal had for the next few decades, until a man with a love of sugar came along. In 1816, a penniless young man named John Redpath arrived on a ship from Scotland in Quebec City and then set off on foot to Montreal. He must have been determined because, apparently, he made the walk barefoot. Although that story most likely has been embellished over time, he most likely just had shoes with a lot of holes in them. Nonetheless, Redpath had trained as a stone mason in England, and that proved to be his path to success in Montreal. With a strong work ethic and a good sense of business, he slowly grew a construction business as the city developed. Only five years after he arrived, he was part of a new consortium that formed in 1820 to build a canal to bypass the Lachine Rapids. The man who arrived in Canada penniless was the main contractor. The consortium bought the land for the canal from the Roman Catholic order, 
who had left it unused for about two decades. Ground was broken on the historic canal project on July 17, 1821. Four years later, the canal was completed, and the first stage of the eventual St. Lawrence Seaway was concluded, and that year Montreal had a population of 27,297 people. It measured 14 kilometers long and had seven locks. Each lock was 30 meters long and 6 meters wide. And the impact on Montreal was immense, as now ships could travel past the Lachine Rapids, and this brought with them a lot more trade, so factories were built along the banks of the canal and people flooded to the city to find work. In 1832, Montreal was incorporated as a city, and by 1871 there were 130,000 people living in the city, and it was the most populous city in Canada. That title would hold until 1998, when Toronto took over. Meanwhile, the Lachine Canal also helped raise John Redpath's profile, and he was commissioned for new projects including the first buildings of McGill University and the stunning Notre Dame Basilica in Montreal. In 1856, he founded Redpath Sugar, and then built the first sugar refinery complex in Canada. By the time he died in 1869, he had seen the annual ship traffic passing through the canal go from 600 vessels in its first year to 13,000 ships. On a bit of a side note, there's a very interesting story about Redpath Sugar. On June 13, 1901, Ada Redpath and her son Jocelyn were found dead in their Montreal mansion. Their bodies were buried within 48 hours, and there was very little investigation into what happened. No one knows what happened, or who killed them, and some claim their ghosts haunted the mansion, which unfortunately was torn down in 2014. A bit of a tangent away from our story, but maybe I will explore this story later in October. The Lachine Canal was a good first step, but to the west another barrier existed, and this one made the Lachine Rapids look like a relaxing bubble bath. Horseshoe Falls rise 57 meters in height and 790 meters in length on the Canadian side, making Niagara Falls a sight to behold and the most powerful waterfall on the entire continent. Every single second, 64,000 cubic meters of water cascade over the falls as Lake Erie drains into Lake Ontario. This is the equivalent of three Olympic-sized swimming pools every single second. Now the falls have existed for 10,000 years, formed by the same retreating ice sheets that form the Great Lakes. And when they first formed, the falls were located 11 kilometers to the south, near present-day Queenston, Ontario. Erosion has slowly moved the falls to their present location. And make sure you go see them, because in about 50,000 years, they will have eroded all the way to Lake Erie, and will cease to exist. I grew up on a farm in central Alberta, so there was not a lot of lakes or rivers near me. There certainly weren't any waterfalls. Several years ago, I did a cross-country drive and I visited Niagara Falls. And if you've never seen the falls, I can't recommend enough that you at least visit them once in your life. They are an awe-inspiring sight that needs to be seen to be believed, to just understand how truly powerful they are. I am planning on a history of the Niagara Falls sometime next year for an episode, but before then, I encourage you to read Pierre Burton's book, Niagara, for a bit of that history. To bypass the falls, a canal was needed that could link Lake Ontario with Lake Erie. And that is where William Hamilton Merritt comes in. He was a businessman in the area and a veteran of the War of 1812. After the war, he bought a store, sawmill, and gristmill on 12 Mile Creek near Niagara Falls. Unfortunately, the water levels of the creek were unpredictable, and that made operating his mill difficult. He turned his attention to the idea of building a canal that could not only bring more business to his mills, but also keep them running with a stable source of running water. In 1818, he borrowed an instrument called a water level to survey a potential route, and with a group of neighbors, they planned out a three-kilometer route to meet the Welland River. On July 4th, 1818, a petition was sent to the Upper Canada Legislature to provide permission for the construction of a canal between 12 Mile Creek and the Welland River. And then Merritt waited. And waited. Until 1823, when an engineer named Hiram Tibbetts conducted a formal survey. His report suggested a canal about 1.2 meters below the surface level of the Welland River. This channel would run from Port Robinson to Allenburg, then follow 12 Mile Creek to Decoos Falls, and then decline and continue to Port Dalhousie on Lake Ontario. The following year, the Welland Canal Company was formed with $150,000 in capitalization. 
The route was adjusted somewhat as well, running from Port Robinson to Allenburg, then north through a series of canal locks to Meryton. On November 30th, 1824, 200 people watched as ground was broken on work that would take five years to complete, and by 1829, the Welland Canal was finished, and a new connection between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario was formed. While the Lachine Rapids were bypassed, Troublesome Rapids existed just 100 kilometers downriver near Cornwall, Ontario, so the British government commissioned the construction of the Cornwall Canal in 1834. It took nine years to build, and when it was finished, it bypassed the Long Sioux Rapids, running for 18 kilometers with six locks. But there was another ongoing problem. Ships kept getting larger, but the canals just stayed the same size. From the west, a ship could travel from Lake Superior to Lake Ontario thanks to the Welland Canal, but the St. Lawrence Canal system stood as a bottleneck to further passage into the ocean. To deal with this growing issue, the government embarked on one of its largest public work projects to that point. It was going to enlarge all existing canals and locks to 4.2 meters in depth. This alleviated the bottleneck, but progress did not stop, and a few years later they ran into the same problem. The companies that hauled the cargo and built the ships wanted something done. If a ship could travel from the Atlantic to Lake Superior, money and time would be saved. In the 1890s, commercial interest pressured for a binational deep water thoroughway. Business may move fast, but governments, they move slow. It took until 1909 for the first U.S.-Canadian Deep Waterways Commission to be formed to study the possibility of building a seaway. This led to the formation of a joint commission, but further movement towards a seaway stalled due to the First World War. In 1921, a report was commissioned on how the efficiency of water navigation could be increased in the St. Lawrence River. It was prepared by Colonel William P. Wooten of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and W.A. Bowden, the Chief Engineer of the Department of Railways and Canals in Canada. In June 1921, the report was presented to the International Joint Commission. Public hearings followed and the final report was issued in December 1921. The Montreal Gazette stated, The Witten bowden report calls for the erection of a series of lift locks and guard locks, deepening the channels, dams, extensive flooding, dikes, control works, embankments, etc., to make the St. Lawrence navigable from Lake St. Louis to Prescott by a channel 25 feet deep and varying in width from 200 to 600 feet. At the time, Canada was governed by William Lyne Mackenzie King and the Liberals, and King was pretty reluctant to proceed with the project because he faced opposition in some areas of Ontario and Quebec. There was a concern among residents that the deepening of the St. Lawrence River would result in more frequent floods. Another issue was that under the plan, two cemeteries would be flooded permanently. In one of those cemeteries was Sir James Whitney, the Premier of Ontario from 1905 to 1914. The Ottawa Journal wrote that this shouldn't be a problem. It stated, George Washington has been moved once, and if the United States could bear that, Ontario should not object to the removal of Sir James Whitney. But it didn't matter, because no progress was made after that point. For the rest of the 1920s, the topic of the St. Lawrence Seaway faded away. In 1930, the Liberals lost a federal election to the Conservatives, and R.B. Bennett became Prime Minister. Two years later, Bennett signed a Treaty of Intent with the United States for the Seaway Project. In November 1932, the treaty was submitted to the U.S. Senate, and talks continued until a vote was held on March 14, 1934. The Senate, though, was unable to get two-thirds of a majority for ratifying the treaty, and it failed. As is becoming apparent, the building of the St. Lawrence Seaway was not one single giant construction project, but many smaller ones over the course of 150 years that led to the main event itself. With each canal built, each rapid bypassed, the dream of a link between the Atlantic and Lake Superior became closer to a reality. When Bennett lost the 1935 election to William Lyne Mackenzie King and the Liberals, efforts to draft a treaty continued. Throughout the 1930s, further attempts were made, but the opposition now came from Premier Mitchell Hepburn in Ontario. Maclean's wrote, Mr. Hepburn didn't want the St. Lawrence Seaway built. He thought the whole thing a waste of money and quite unnecessary. Since the federal government needed the cooperation of both Quebec and Ontario without Hepburn, the plan for a St. Lawrence Seaway could simply not go forward. Meanwhile, in the United States, efforts were in place to drum up support for the project. In 1936, the Great Lakes Harbors Association and Great Lakes Tidewaters Commission 
Along with delegates from eight Great Lakes states met with U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to obtain his support. He stated he was open to the idea. But as before, things didn't move far beyond that point. Two years later, in 1938, Mitchell Hepburn did a complete 180 on his opposition to the Seaway and became anxious to get the project moving forward. At the time, Hepburn was dealing with low popularity due to his crackdown at the General Motors plant strike in Oshawa. Hepburn now needed the project because not only could it create jobs, but possibly raise his popularity in the province. In January 1940, an agreement was reached between Canada and the United States. One year later, Roosevelt and William Lyne Mackenzie King made an agreement to build a joint hydro and navigation works. McLean's wrote, Uncle Sam came back and asked the same old question. This time he had a pretty determined look in his eye. He also had a new reason for doing the St. Lawrence job. The new reason was national defense. President Roosevelt seemed eager to get the seaway built at the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway Conference in Detroit. He said, The United States needs the St. Lawrence Seaway for defense. The United States needs this great landlocked sea as a secure haven in which it will be able to build ships and more ships to protect our trade and our shores. Despite the support of the president, any bill to join Canada in construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway simply failed to pass Congress, and neither Mackenzie King nor Roosevelt would live to see the day when the Seaway would break ground. But then, after the Second World War, things changed. The population was booming and trade internationally was increasing at an exponential rate as economies skyrocketed. Canada was now led by Louis Saint Laurent, who took office in 1948 when William Lyne Mackenzie King retired. He saw the benefit of the project and he was eager to move on construction. For those keeping track, the efforts to get the St. Lawrence Seaway built in the 20th century has gone through two prime ministers and two presidents. It will go through a few more before the project is officially designated as complete. So far, we've seen small canals become larger canals as Canada attempted to build something that could bypass the many obstacles that existed on the St. Lawrence and into the Great Lakes. Yet, while Canada always seemed to be relatively on board, for the most part, the United States continually lagged behind. Whether it was not seen as worth it or there was a worry about abandoning the profitable Erie Canal in the United States, it's hard to say. Yet, there was something on the horizon that was going to change everything going forward. It was war, and the need for national defense slowly brought the Great St. Lawrence Seaway into prominent focus, and we'll learn more about that after the break. We've been following the story of the St. Lawrence Seaway for hundreds of years now. The St. Lawrence River was created by huge glaciers thousands of years ago and used by the indigenous peoples for centuries. But now, as ships were getting bigger, the canals that existed simply were not up to the task. Coming up, as Canada continually waits for the United States to jump on board through the Great Depression and the Second World War, it will get impatient. Eventually, Canada will just decide that if there's going to be a St. Lawrence Seaway, it will have to be built by Canada itself. And that would prove to be just the push that the United States needed. Down in the United States, Harry S. Truman was president and he took over following the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1945. And while Truman wanted the Seaway, the rest of his government simply didn't. On August 26, 1951, a U.S. Congressional Committee rejected the St. Lawrence Seaway project. After two decades of refusals, Canadians were impatient, and the federal government decided that if the United States was not going to be part of it, then Canada was just going to build the Seaway itself and reap the rewards from it completely. This attitude was shared by Kay Kozva, a hydro employee in Niagara Falls. On September 7, 1951, Ontario Premier Leslie Frost received a $10 bill in a letter in a donation towards the St. Lawrence Seaway. The letter said, In order to do my share as a Canadian, I have decided to work overtime and contribute my earnings towards the all-Canadian St. Lawrence Seaway. On September 28, 1951, the two leaders met and Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent told President Harry Truman that the Canadian government would construct the seaway completely within Canadian territory. This was a real concern for Truman, who could see that it would give Canada all the revenue from such a seaway as opposed to splitting the revenue should they share the territory. Regardless, Canada would grant the United States permission to use it. 
When news got out about the ultimatum, there was a harsh reaction from American Senator George Aiken of Vermont, a supporter of the Seaway Project. He said, It is a disgrace for the United States to force Canada to do this for their own protection. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Truman issued a statement saying his preference was a joint construction project. Representative Tom Pickett of Texas said, He's finally showing a little judgment. As America warmed to the joint project, Canada was not about to wait. On December 21, 1951, the Canadian federal government created the Crown Corporation St. Lawrence Seaway Authority. President Truman wanted U.S. involvement but still struggled to garner support. When a bill was put forward to the U.S. Senate in early 1952, Truman said, If Canada constructs the waterway, then no doubt some future administration will allow New York and Quebec to obtain all the power. This is one of the worst things that could happen in the northeast section of the country. His call to action fell on deaf ears and the motion was killed in the Senate. Instead, the Senate passed a motion, 43 to 40, to return the bill to its Foreign Relations Committee for further study. Canadian Transport Minister Lyle Chevier said nothing would slow down Canadian plans to build the seaway. And by the end of 1952, Truman was once again appealing to Congress. Representatives Harry McGregor of Ohio, who was a major critic, shifted gears in January 1953 and would agree to the project if terms were worked out in advance on sharing construction and maintenance costs. On January 12, 1953, debate began in the U.S. Senate and a bill emerged from the House of Representatives Committee of Public Works on February 22, 1954. Unfortunately, Truman would never see the seaway built as president, nor would it become part of his legacy. On January 20th, 1953, Dwight Eisenhower replaced him as President of the United States. As for that bill introduced in February, it was approved by the House and Senate in May 1954, and the long road to American involvement in the project had finally come to an end. On May 13th, 1954, President Eisenhower signed the St. Lawrence Seaway Bill, also known as the Wiley Dondero Seaway Act and joining Eisenhower at the signing was Canadian Ambassador A.D.P. Heaney. Eisenhower used nine pens to sign the bill. Three were made from wood recovered from Fort Detroit in Michigan, which was the last British-held fort in the United States. Eisenhower said, Now work can begin on this great project. In a story about the St. Lawrence Seaway, we are nearly three quarters into the story before we get to the actual construction happening. As with so many things, though, the story of an event, person, or project in Canadian history often has much more lead-up and small steps before things really get moving. The same is true for one of the biggest construction projects in Canadian history. On August 10, 1954, there was a groundbreaking ceremony that took place on the American side of the border. Governor Thomas Dewey of New York State pressed a button to set off a dynamite charge, while on the Canadian side, the ceremony was a bit less explosive. Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent dug into the dirt with a shovel, along with Ontario Premier Leslie Frost. The Montreal Star reported, Mr. Saint Laurent, after breaking ground, said that the ceremony has been characterized by the spirit of friendship and harmony which Canada and the US have come to accept as normal. The Saint Lawrence River has become a bond rather than a barrier. He said that the project will bind together all residents of the Saint Lawrence Valley. And now, the project really got to work. One of the biggest parts of the project was the construction of the 2090 megawatt power dam near Cornwall, Ontario. Now this came as a mixed blessing for Cornwall because although it was expected to help in the future, especially thanks to the $1 million filtration plant the city received as part of the agreement, there were several problems for the city during construction. The city was flooded with workers who had to live in trailers and rented rooms due to a housing shortage. Rents skyrocketed and many families were pushed out. As many as 5,000 people traveled to see the construction as well, causing traffic chaos. And on paydays, construction workers were often rowdy at the end of the work week and kept the small police force very busy. Construction finished on July 1, 1958, when 27 tons of explosives were used to demolish the coffer dam that diverted the St. Lawrence River away from the new dam, and then it took only four days for the new hydro plant to become operational and begin providing power to Ontario and there were many changes to old infrastructure because of the St. Lawrence Seaway construction. Bridges had to be rebuilt to allow for larger ships to pass underneath. At the Jacques Cartier Bridge in Montreal, the piers were enlarged and the bridge was raised to 120 feet. A new higher span was built along the old bridge, then it was raised with hydraulic jacks and detached from the bridge frame. 
The new span was then lifted and fitted into place. The process of swapping bridge decks took only two hours. The Montreal Gazette reported, The spring of 1955 may seem like just another spring in Montreal, but already huge bulldozers and other heavy equipment are about to move onto two projects bordering the South Shore. Last week, the authority called for tenders for excavation and construction of the seaway along about 4,900 feet in the river opposite Montreal, extending to the upper end of the present ship channel. In Ontario and Quebec, rivalries between towns sprung up as they all vied for a share of what the seaway could provide. Both Toronto and Montreal said they would be the gateway of the seaway. Toronto Mayor Fred Gardner stated, Toronto will have a population of 2 million in 15 years. Nothing can stop us from being one of the most important cities in the world. And he turned out to be right in that regard. Toronto passed 2 million people in population in 1971. As a result of the construction of the Cornwall Dam, 15,400 hectares of land were flooded, which created Lake St. Lawrence. And within that area were several communities, railways, and highways that went through the land, and all would be lost to the lake. Altsville, Dickinson's Landing, Ferrens Point, Maple Grove, Miles Roches, Moulinette, Santa Cruz, Sheik's Island, Wales, and Woodlands were all lost beneath the waves. These communities became known as the Lost Villages. Residents were given market value for their homes, although many felt they were cheated because the Seaway Plan had decreased the property values before the government compensated them. And two communities were relocated, rather than demolished. Iroquois was a larger town site, and the decision was made to move its population to a new site, and 152 buildings, mostly homes, were relocated. The community is now known as South Dundas, after its amalgamation with Matilda, Williamsburg, and Morrisburg in 1998. Now Morrisburg was the second community relocated because one-third of the community would be lost to the St. Lawrence Seaway project, including its main street and original business district. A total of 87 homes were moved and the entire downtown business district was demolished and relocated to a shopping plaza. Think about where you live now. Perhaps you've lived there for decades or maybe your family has lived in the area for a century or more. Now think about being told you have to leave. You have no choice, really. The St. Lawrence is going to start rising and your home is going to be underwater. Yes, the government is offering you money for your home. Does that replace the many memories you have there? What did Cy Denny think, knowing that his hometown was going to be no more? What would you think, knowing the place you loved is going to be under the waves? That one day, all that will exist of that place is the memories that you formed over the course of your life. It's a sobering thought, and one many people have had, regarding many projects in Canadian history. The Canadian National Railway line also moved 1.1 kilometers north of its original location. And part of the flooded area included Chrysler's Farm, a location of a major battle during the War of 1812. But the monument marking the battle's location was moved. Today, a few remnants of these villages remain and sidewalks and building foundations can be seen under the water or even along the shoreline when water levels are low. In all, 525 homes, 6,500 people, 64 kilometers of railway and 56 kilometers of highway were relocated while 20,000 acres of farmland was lost. The Akwesasane people also lost 1,200 acres of reserve land and 15,000 acres of their traditional land. But unlike the residents of the lost villages, they were not consulted and they were not compensated for their losses until 2008 when they finally received monetary compensation. Meanwhile, by the summer of 1956, over $122 million had been spent on Phase 1 of the project, which included the excavation and dredging, and everything was well on its way. Phase 2, which included the mechanical works, was just starting. And even locations far from the seaway were excited to enjoy the benefits of the seaway. In Labrador, the iron ore produced in the area would be shipped to Pennsylvania and then inland through rail. This came with high transportation costs and the maximum demand for Labrador ore was about 10 million tons per year as a result. But with the seaway, the ore could get into the interior much easier and cheaper, allowing for upwards of 20 to 30 million more tons of ore to be sold by the province. On April 25, 1959, the St. Lawrence Seaway officially opened. The Windsor Star reported, Opening today to ships from the Seven Seas, the new waterway has seven steps leading from the riverfront metropolis to landbound harbors and the five Great Lakes. McLean's wrote, With the seaway completed, there will be no physical barrier to prevent British Ocean ships from sailing up the Great Lakes to Fort William and loading grain there. 
Each lock was 800 feet long and made of concrete and circumvented obstacles in the river such as rapids and the dam. The first step for a ship entering the seaway was to go under the Jacques Cartier Bridge, then into the Lachine Canal. The first lock lifted the boat 15 feet, while the second lifted it 30 feet. Then it would traverse Lake St. Louis into another channel with two more locks, then into Lake St. Francis and two more locks. On the first day, 68 ships stretched 225 kilometers down the seaway. On the ships were Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, 118 Canadian MPs, 21 senators, and 7 US congressmen. And then on June 26, 1959, the official public opening ceremony was attended by Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, President Dwight Eisenhower, and Queen Elizabeth II. President Eisenhower said, May this example never be forgotten by us. May it never be ignored by others. For in the reasonable resolution of the acute international problems of our time rests the single hope for world prosperity and happiness and peace with justice for all. Queen Elizabeth II said, This partnership is most agreeably symbolized, Mr. President, in the fact that you and I have joined together to perform this ceremony today. Over 40,000 people were in attendance, and the Sioux Star wrote that 300 Roman Catholic church bells, the horns and sirens of 50 freighters, joined the cheer of the crowd to welcome the opening of the seaway. The total construction of the seaway cost $470 million, 336.2 million of which was paid by the Canadian government. The cost was mitigated by a toll system that was expected to compensate for construction costs within 50 years. Over the course of its construction, 22,000 people were employed at one point or another, and today the Seaway generates $3.4 billion in business in the United States and Canada, and each year, over 250 million tons of cargo moves through the Seaway. But not everything with the Seaway has been beneficial. The opening made the American Erie Canal obsolete, which caused a severe economic decline in upstate New York, and also had an adverse effect on the environment. With so many ships moving through the seaway, it's provided a conduit for many aquatic species to reach areas outside their typical habitat, and invasive species have become a serious problem. The zebra mussel has become one of the most damaging invasive species in the Great Lakes. They were first detected in Canada in the Great Lakes in 1988, it's believed the species was introduced in the ballast water of ocean-going ships. The zebra mussel can grow so densely that it covers native mussels in the water. They're responsible for the near extinction of many species in the Great Lakes by overcompeting species for food and even suffocating native mussels and clams. They can also block pipelines and water intake systems, municipal water supplies, and hydroelectric dams. It's estimated that the zebra mussel has cost businesses and communities $5 billion since 1988 power companies account for $3 billion of that. And while attempts to slow the spread have been initiated, the species has reached as far as Lake Winnipeg and shows no signs of slowing down. Now if you want to hear more about this in detail, I recommend you check out our sister podcast, What Happened To, where host Erica investigates this invasive species and what can be done to slow it down with its environmental impact. I hope you enjoyed that episode and our look at the St. Lawrence Seaway. This show is researched, produced, and written by me, Craig Baird, with the help of Dila Velasquez. Audio production and design by Rosalind Kufor. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help other people find these amazing stories. And there are so many for you to sink your teeth into. If you enjoy this podcast, then please check out my other podcasts, From John to Justin, Canada, A Yearly Journey, Pucks and Cups, and Canada's Great War. We love hearing from you, so if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com or stop by my website and social media. I'll include all of those in my show notes. Until next time, I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X.